Yeah, I mean, they have some some of them have space and they do take on manure and horse bedding, and that's really common here because we have a lot of that as well. Um, so this would be an added benefit to that compost operation they already had on site. So that's sort of where we fit in. But farmers have not always been open armed because we just got the legislation passed this year to allow this kind of operation to even exist and be a, a, a viable option for farmers to add. Uh, right, and, and anything back. new like that, there, there's skepticism, obviously, with what you're doing until they understand the process. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're legislation heavy in California, so yeah. you're always going to have to deal with that if you're going to do business here. Yeah. Um, you, guys, you you brought in some additional worm. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the bucket okay. and pull that out, right? You, yeah. Do you want to tell us about what, what that is? Because so, we're back up live on Facebook right oh, now. Oh, we are. Yeah, I have no internet connection, though, on the computer, Brian, so you'll have to manage the... Um, the the um, video from your computer but i'm going to pull those out and show them onto the camera for people to see so go ahead and tell us about what that is that they're seeing uh so you're going to see the red wigglers which are going to be the common name you hear used for composting um they are very efficient at composting and so that's definitely a good option um, but if you end up at the local bait and tackle and you get some earthworms don't be afraid to throw those in there too they'll they'll do some some good work as well um but you're going to see a lot of the casting because where i pulled these worms from in their little worm windrow was uh pretty much totally transformed into the casting or the worm poop um meaning they process through all of the food waste that was diverted from the landfill um, they ate through it and they created this viable um, nutrient dense fertilizer that um, would be good for anybody's home garden or farm. And there's a lot of worms you're picking out of there, Tiger. Are obviously, you, are you finding any? Yeah. 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 And that that soil looks like just the the best soil in the world. It is just so dark and rich. Yeah, I mean that's really pure casting. You're, yeah. you're asking about the size of the worms, Tiger. Um, are there different sizes there? Yeah. So yeah. what I do mostly is verma culture. Um, meaning that I'm breeding, I'm, I'm, I'm making it a situation where they're breeding more, so less food, really, and they're not doing so much work. They're doing a lot of rubbing up against each other, which <laughs> is kind of what you want if you're going to do vermiculture. So you're going to have a lot of different variations of ages there. You're going to have the really small, tiny little eggs you're going to see speckled throughout, and then um, you know anywhere from two to probably ten 10 weeks or so there, I guess. Now, the thing with red wiggler worms, too, is that if we can see them, I'll, I'll hold them up to the camera in just a second, but maybe an inch, inch and a half long. Mm -hmm. You know, most people think, oh, an earthworm, and you see some large earthworms, right. you know, sometimes four or five inch long. Yeah, the size know, of solid, a small snake. Yeah, solid earthworms. And you would think, the oh, well, it's a bigger animal. It can probably break down things quicker, do a better job. But these small worms can you know out eat the earthworms quickly and better and they're small and they always stay small they don't i mean what would be the yeah. largest red wiggler that you would see in a bin i mean i've like, four inches they're okay. probably they get kind of fat and chubby and then they're about four inches long but they'll eat i believe it's two times their body weight a day yeah yeah it's so. pretty impressive what they do and then the one thing i do if anybody has a worm bin out there or is planning on starting a worm bin one of their I think their favorite, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is melons. They they go crazy. Like if you put a half or, or a, a hollowed out melon rind in there, yeah, cantaloupe, watermelon, whatever, you come out the next day and they're all up in that, and the thing is just just the shell is left, wow. just the skin is left of the melon. It's pretty amazing, you know what they do. But then there's other things they'll go through. What are what are some things that you would tell people not to put in? A worm bin that they maybe they have a false impression. They don't like citrus. Mm -hmm. they, they just stay away from that. I mean, eventually the it'll break down, but you're going to see it in there forever. Same thing with avocado skins and things like that that are better off going through a composting phase. So if you have the dual composting, you know, f pile and then a worm bin, your your mm -hmm. worms are actually going to be much more efficient. You're going to get a lot more castings throughout the year by feeding them that pre-composted material that's already had some other beneficial bacteria and mycelium hopefully running through there and breaking down the cellulose walls and things like that, which is what's really difficult for them to get through, you know, in the end of it. And the citrus is probably a little bit too sour or acidic. Yeah, or something. yeah just, absolutely. Hey, just like me, I have yeah. my, I have the things that I like to eat first sure. versus, you yeah. know, push the off to the side a little bit. Last. Yeah. So, you know, Bree, 
thank you very much for joining us this weekend. Um, you know, we talked about closing the loop. We talked about what you guys do. Um, how can people get, you know, more information? How can people reach out to you if they had questions? I mean, we have people that are listening from all over or are going to watch this. And, you know, like I said, sometimes there's people out there that aren't even in your area but maybe want to find out more information about your guys' model. So what do you? what's the best way to get a hold of you guys? I think that following our Instagram or Facebook page is always the best way. Um, we're really active there and everything that we have coming up in the future, uh, including a nationwide tour to discuss things like this on the road with people in their communities tackling the real problems that face them personally. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, all of our updates about that coming up starting in August. And so we hope to meet many people throughout the United States and get to have lots more of these conversations. Who? So, but closing the loop will continue on while you guys are on the tour, right? <laughs> do you want to do uh, another radio show? <laughs> That's another whole hour, right? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. I'm, there, there's some major changes coming up. All good things. I think that we're going to set all of our current clients up for success, and I hope that everybody will be proud and excited to see about to see the changes that, that we have coming. So. Yeah, it's an exciting tour you guys have planned, though, because yeah. you plan on taking the whole fam, and yeah. you guys are just driving, right? Yes, and we're going to try to document. Uh, we're going to do, like, a television show weekly where we're going to document sort of the trials and tribulations of trying to do it zero waste and trying to handle our own waste mm -hmm. streams on the road and, and meeting these people uh, and begging them to take our food scraps <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and trying to kind of figure out what... Um, you know, what that's going to be like and how that can be applicable to people. Yeah. That's exciting. So Beautiful. Yeah, well, a lot of fun so stuff planned. You know, good good things in the future, and we look forward to following you guys and following your journey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. And by the way, we are back on Facebook Live if you went to your radios. So go back on Facebook as we continue. One more segment coming up, hour number one here. Uh, thank you so much, Bree, Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco. I'm Brian Maine again, back up on Facebook. It is Saturday morning. Thank you for joining us here on the Garden America Radio Programming. A break coming right back. I'm your bio-advanced lawn care scientist, here to introduce new all-in-one weed and feed. It kills lawn weeds like dandelion and clover. Plus, it kills crabgrass all in one easy step. And it has micro-feed action, which creates a more nutritious, resilient root zone. That's the key to a healthy green lawn. Make the switch and try the one that weeds, feeds, plus kills crabgrass. New all-in-one weed and feed from BioAdvanced Science-Based Solutions. Get more from the blue bag. Always read and follow the label instructions. Do you have insects on your roses? Do you have boars damaging your trees and shrubs due to stress or the drought? This is Tiger Palafox with Garden America Radio. Fertilome Tree and Shrub Drench is a great product that will give you season-long protection against many insects. Fertilome Tree and Shrub Drench can act as a preventer or a curative for insects that suck, chew, or bore on your plants. This may be the easiest product to use. Simply measure, mix in a bucket, and pour around the base of the tree. One application can last up to full year. Protect your trees with Fertilome Tree and Shrub Drench. Find it at your local independent nursery or Fertilome.com. This alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right. General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for under $30,000. You heard right. That's 5,000 square feet under $30,000. Manufacturers, if you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. Call 800-605-5370. 800-605-5370. Call 800-605-5370. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than 
$1,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-285-4765 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-285-4765. Again, 800-285-4765. If you're struggling to pay or haven't been making your student loan payments, listen carefully to this urgent alert. Have you been out of school for 10 or more years and you're still making your student loan payments? Are your student loans past due or even in default? Can't go back to school because of an old student loan problem? Fast Track Student Loans can get your student loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. One quick 10-minute call could help you solve your student loan problems. So call right now. Not available in all states. Payments may vary based on income. 800-685-0129. 800-685-0129. 800-685-0129. That's 800-685-0129. This is an urgent health notice for all residents suffering from back, neck, knee, and wrist pain. You may qualify for a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you, but the deadline is fast approaching. Simply call the Health Alert Hotline now. You heard right. You may qualify for a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace. These items may even be covered by Medicare or your private insurance. The Health Alert Hotline is your brace company. These opportunity to get a pain relieving back neck knee or wrist brace at little or no cost to you 800-306-1760-800-306-1760-800-306-1760 that's eight Welcome back to the Garden America Radio Show with Brian, John, and Tiger. The phone lines are open right now at 855-424-9825. That's 855-424-9825 or john at gardenamerica.com. And we are back. It is uh, Garden America, 51 (laughs) minutes after the hour. All kinds of technical problems this morning. We uh, lost our uh, Facebook audio a while ago, and then we lost our audio back here in the studio. So we are going to try to uh, muscle our way through the last segment here, 51 minutes after the hour. I cannot hear myself, but I trust that those listening on uh, AM 1240 and the rest of the BizTalk radio network uh, can hear us as uh, we continue and just struggle through one of those days, Tiger. Yeah, it's it's fun. It keeps it interesting. I, c- I can hear you uh, through the, the studio, okay. but not through my headphones and Nobody else cares as long as they can hear us, I guess. Exactly, we're okay. exactly, which might make it difficult to take a phone interview, but I think we'll be doing okay. <laughs> hey, I wanted to get to some of the questions that came through during the first bit of our show on Facebook Live. Do you, do you want to go ahead and start answering yeah, let's, some let's of those do questions? Yeah, some of those if you still have those. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I remember so- we had the one, uh, we were talking about this transition period mm-hmm. when you're going from spring or late winter into early spring and you're still having freezes and somebody asked whether the use of cloches would be good and that's something they've used for hundreds of years uh, more popular in europe than here but america has its own uh versions of cloches you know like the wall of water yeah i don't know if you've heard of those but those are pretty popular but yeah a cloche basically is any covering that will keep a plant from freezing insulates it insulates it yeah so in in Europe, they usually use glass containers. Those are cloches that they put over the plant. And and I think that's a great idea. Anything that can protect a plant. Now they have row covers that can, uh, technically not a cloche, but used in the same principle uh, to insulate the plants from the cold. And the only thing I would say is that the only um, disclaimer 
is that if you are in an area that gets hot, you have to be a savvy gardener because you have to take it off. That's right. Because you can have the the opposite effect on the young seedling if you accidentally leave it on and it's 75 degrees outside or 80 degrees outside. Right. It's 100 in that little cloche and uh, you can melt your little seedling. So, you know, savvy gardeners or people in cool areas, not a problem. But if you're just trying to get a jump start on the season and you're in a warm climate, then you have to be a little bit more savvy and knowing, leave it on at night, take it off during the day, and you just kind of do that on a regular basis to get it kind of jump started. The other thing, if it's cold and you want to protect plants from freezing and you're using something like plastic, you need to be, you know, like visqueen, you want to realize that if you have plastic on the leaf of a tree, let's take a citrus for example, that it actually will be colder where the plastic touches the leaf of the tree than if the plastic wasn't there at all. So you're going to get freeze damage more so by covering the tree. Uh, What you would want to do would be to put up poles or something to hold the plastic over the tree but away from touching the leaves. Yeah, keeping that gap between it. And then, um, you know, I I, I think that one of the things is people have to remember is that a lot of times this is just young plants or shrubs. You know, the the older the plants or shrubs get when they are in the yard, they're more tolerant mm-hmm. to those things. Right. So this is only really for new plantings. Or maybe if you live in an area where, like John, you push the limits of your environment, meaning you <laughs> want to have that Hawaiian native plant right, exactly. and you live in Fallbrook, California, then you need to be more cautious of it. Uh, another question that came through on Facebook was uh, regarding bees, keeping – Keeping bees in your backyard beehive. Now, that's a it's a tough thing because there's a lot of a lot of ways that people go when it comes to backyard in, bees. In your backyard beehive that you put there on purpose. Yeah. So okay, so this yeah. is like people are trying to have a beehive in their backyard, and what will happen sometimes is that hive will move on. They they'll go to try to find a better place to live now is that because the hive gets too crowded after so many bees they need to move on because of well the, the, the usually lack of, uh, the, in other words they've used up their resources well usually you're hitting the perfect point is they're using up the resources now they don't use up their resources in the hive they use up their resources to where they're at meaning if your hive is placed in an area and there's not a lot of pollinators around you know not mm-hmm. a lot of flowers not a lot of trees that are going to have pollinators for that hive the hive has to move it's got to move to an area that can go within its radius to come back to the hive at a reasonable rate and continue their 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 city you know this would be like opening up a city not near a power plant right you know it doesn't make any sense right or a water source so um that's the number one thing why a hive would move. They don't usually move too much because of overcrowding because what will happen is when the hive gets overcrowded, the queen will get another queen, and that queen will then take half of the hive with her to a new location, and they'll just keep doing that when the hive gets crowded. So they, the bees amongst themselves raise a new queen. Exactly. Okay. And then that queen gets sent off to go find her own home but takes away some of the population of the current hive. And that helps with the overcrowding. So they kind of monitor overcrowding mm-hmm. in their own way. Usually why a hive would move is because of their resources locally. Water, food are the biggest so things. So not, not the resources within the hive, but no. the environment around them. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, you know, but there's a lot of phenomenons with this. I mean, sometimes a queen just doesn't like her house and she wants to move. And it's sometimes as simple <laughs> as that. It really is. <laughs> no, we won't go there. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, sometimes it's really just as simple as that. Sure. And, and, um, you know, it's a hard thing because usually backyard beekeepers, they get Queens from mail order online sources. Um, sometimes locally people will like a, a bee collection company, people that have, yeah. you call a company, they come out and get that beehive that's plaguing your house. Well, sometimes those people know people that have hives and they'll say, Hey, I just collected a queen. Do you want her? And, you know, and, and, and it's moving. And, you sure. know, it's not always easy to move, and sometimes the, the bees don't react well to that. But yeah. for the most part, if you can keep them water source and a great food source locally, they'll stick around in, in your backyard hive. 
Okay, yeah, a, a, um, a note on there that says that, that uh, they're very impressed with your knowledge of bees, Tiger, on Facebook. Oh, thank you very much. I, have I, you moved I've to been, Hive? I've been stung by them a number <laughs> of times. So I think by osmosis. Yeah. One time I was up in a tree and unknowingly cut a branch off with a full hive on it. Oh, great. Let's just say uh, getting out of that tree is very scary. But yeah. and, and it, I, got, learned, I got stung like 25 times. But you learned that you were not allergic to the bee sting, or yeah. otherwise you would have been in a, a big trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, but it wasn't the first time I've been stung like 25 times by bee, the, I had bee a bees. a traumatic situation with bees when I was young also, even maybe on the level with the skiing incident. You know, we, we, got, we got a break coming up here. I think uh, are we close to that break yet. I don't hear the music. Uh, do we hear anything? <laughs> I don't know. You've got the watch over, or the clock over there. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, John, with your story here. With the, the uh... well, it was just we hit a hive out in the yard, and and uh, I think I was maybe nine years old, and bees started coming out, and they started stinging me. So as a young kid, you you know, I went a little hysterical, and I started running and ran into the house, screaming, and locked myself in the bathroom. And then look, and there's bees all over me, oh. and I'm locked in the bathroom. <laughs> it's like one of those twilight shower. zone things. We're we going to top of the hour break coming up and uh, get everything all situated here. Back on Facebook Live and the radio six minutes after. Stay with us. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio Studios.
Check, check, one. Okay. Okay, we are back. It is uh, seven minutes after the hour here on Garden America. And, uh, yeah, all kinds of problems that we're working through, so we do appreciate your patience. I do believe we have uh, Facebook up, but no audio on Facebook. We have no audio in our no, studio. We do, oh, we do have. Oh, we're good. Yeah. Okay, Tiger says we're good. I got the thumbs up. <laughs> so that's what's going on. John is just enjoying the whole thing here. So thank you for your patience. So we'll get through this, and whatever we don't figure out today, we will figure out uh, during the week when I come back to work. Tiger, that's how things work. Right. And. And John will just enjoy watching us try to figure out what's going on over here. Uh, My sister says she can't hear us, but <laughs> that, now she but can. Now she can. Right? Now yeah. she can. Okay, yeah. that's good. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. That's uh, sometimes that is the only way we know that we're getting through is by some of the feedback that we get right. uh, via Facebook and uh, those of you who are listening uh, via streaming. She also said she doesn't remember the bee incident, but I, if I'm not mistaken, she was involved in it because it was when we moved to Farmington Hills. Now, how old were you at the time? So maybe that's a reason. You know, I, I can't remember. I'm thinking that maybe I was around 10. I'm not sure. She would have been a couple years younger. My, my brother, though, my youngest brother... Uh, was allergic to bees. Oh, no. You know, and he always had to carry one of those. EpiPens? EpiPens, yeah. And my son Jesse, the same thing. So it might be a hereditary type. And Jesse is works in trees. He, you know, right. that's, yeah, he's, he's got to be careful right. about that because it's my accident. I mean, sometimes you're you're looking at a tree and you cut a branch. You don't 
always see the hive on it or right. in the tree or bush or right. whatever it is. Well, hey, you had explained to Brian very well uh, about the bees. The bees, yeah, but, but not, not the birds not yet. Not the birds, so the that birds. should be next. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> another discussion for another see, day. How, how do I know? I, how did I know he was going yeah. there? You know, <laughs> you guys are on. You guys are on it together right now. Hey, uh, another qu- another comment I would say that came across via Facebook when Bree was in studio, and I had mentioned about the red wiggler worms loving melon. And Stephanie McCoy on our Facebook also said, and it's a great note for people: if you have a red w- a red worm bin, one of the biggest things that people have difficulty with is they want to harvest the castings. But then I want to take all the worms out with it. Well, if you put a melon on top of the pile, that'll draw all the red wow. wigglers out of the castings and into that melon. So then when you take out those castings, very minimal population is left over in there. So, yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for reminding us that little tip for people that have a worm casting bin that – it's a good way to draw the worms out of the soil, so that mm-hmm. way when you go to harvest the soil, you have minimal population in there because they're all up in that melon eating. It's fun stuff. Lot. It's 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 crazy. It's like a nest of worms whenever you kind of see that happen. They just you know, go Sharon, crazy. Uh, used to have a worm bin. I don't know if she still does, and she used to have a little uh, spigot on the end, and the oh, yeah. liquid would drain off. Drain on. out the tea. Yeah. It's, and she used that a lot. Oh, I mean, the worm tea is just like compost tea. It's basically a liquid form of the condensed nutrients and, and minerals and things that are within that compost. Um, it just comes out in a liquid fashion that you can water your plants with it. Some people dilute it down, use it as a foliar spray. Some people just put it straight on plants. But there's um, a lot of ways to use it, but... I think that most people just use it straight and water their plants with it. It's kind of a really easy way to use it. There was, uh, there were a few things I wanted to mention the first hour when we were on in San Diego, and I didn't get to do it. But uh, one was I wanted to invite people to the succulent celebration up in Bonsall, California. Uh, Bob Reedmuller and myself were book signing yesterday, and we're selling our book. If you want to come, come up, we'd be happy to autograph one for and you. And that is today. It is today. It started yesterday. And there could be goes, people on streaming that are hearing yeah, this. Yeah, it also goes through today. And uh, and I was I mentioned to you I was surprised that people came from uh, out of state, New York, South Carolina, and uh, Tennessee. And I was saying, did you come specifically for this? And they said, yes, just just specifically for that, this. That, that surprised you, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. Well, that's good, John. That's great. Uh, they, had a, they had a huge turnout. And uh, I'll, after the show, I'm going to drive back up there. So so that'll be fun. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, and I wanted to mention the first hour, is that if you ever wanted to move to Fallbrook, <laughs> uh, don't ask me why, but uh, we are moving, and my house is going up for so sale. So you, you're actually uh, telling people right now that your house is for sale and you're looking for buyers and bidders? <laughs> That's right, and if you buy through the show, maybe we can work out some Something kind of commission with the plants. deal. <laughs> no, if you buy through the show, he'll leave – all the plants. Oh, yeah, right. Ugh. You know, I really wish that somebody would buy my house who was a plant person. That right. would they could take, appreciate that it. That could appreciate them, and I could make the arrangement, hey, I need to come and take cuttings every now and then and mm-hmm. of the roses. But Now, I, you've been in that house for 35 30, years? 30 years. 30 years. 30 years. That's a huge life change. Well, there's 30 years of plants in the ground. Wow. Every single plant on, on my property was personally planted by me. Every single one. Do you have pictures of what that that backyard looked like when you moved in? I might, because but everything would, is gone. That, that well, yeah, I mean that would be a good day. a good comparison to, to be able to look at that to where it is today. Because yeah. even since I've known you, it's changed a lot. Well, you, I showed you when you came over how many plants, and I think I showed Tiger too that I had planted from seed. You know, the cowrie tree in the backyard, which is huge now, I right. planted from a seed. That fishtail palm, planted from a seed. So, I don't know. But I am moving to, uh, we're going to build a house on three and a half acres. So, finally, wow. I, I'll have room to put things in the ground. All my roads. <laughs> yeah, everything that you've wanted. But it would be just a matter of time before you're going to run out of room. I know that. Even with three and a half acres. I don't think so. I'll give you a couple, two or three years. 
I think I'm too old to run out of room now. <laughs> <laughs> I could, but I I would doubt it. So I could, did, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, John. I was just going to say, one of the things that really impressed me at Waterwise Botanicals up mm-hmm. in Bonsall yesterday, and I don't know if you've ever been up there, Tiger, but they, yes. they had uh, a mounded area that was landscaped. In the mound was a plumeria tree. Mm-hmm. And you follow this mound around, and there's a couple other plumeria trees. And then underneath the plumeria trees... Uh, for shrubbery is bromeliads, nothing but bromeliads and some epidendron orchids planted right there in the ground. Wow. And I think because it's raised, they used a real loose, mulchy-type mix that mm-hmm. would drain well. And everything they had was hardy. They used uh, acmeas for the bromeliads and epidendrons for the orchids. And I, w- I was so impressed by that because you you, you see it in Florida, oh, but all, you, you yeah. rarely see bromeliads in the ground in, in California. In that location, Waterwise Botanicals, is is great for display gardens, but also kind of showing you what you really can grow. I mean, they grow right. a lot of different things outside that people wouldn't always think to grow outside, but they show you it can be done. And, you know, like you're saying, a couple little changes mm-hmm. to your environment is all that it takes to make it possible. Um, do they still have the barrel cactus on the slope? You know, you know, in the backdrop to the whole yard, they had that big slope. Yeah, they have a lot of things planted there. They've got, uh, I think, next to the barrel c- cactus is a whole area of uh, Schwarzkopf bayonium. Right. So you yeah. had all the black next but, to the gold. But they had a ton of barrel cactus. Do they still have a lot, or did they minimize they it now? They have two tons now. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's amazing to see that they slope. They have those ponds with the fish in them. Yep. The channel catfish and things. Yep. Yeah. It's Yeah, it's a very... It's a fun place to bring kids. To oh yeah, let them look around, run around. Lots yeah. of room, lots of lots of fun stuff. And a to lot see. of they had great speakers yesterday. Um, Nan Sturman gave oh, a talk great. and probably had two hundred people mm-hmm. uh, talk, listening to her. Uh, wow. Our friend uh, Deborah Lee Baldwin was there. Who's, yeah, I saw who, I saw that? the who? Who? crown pictures on her social media. Oh yeah, did she all put the them people, all up? All the people. She that... really was a big help to Bob and I because. We had a table where we're doing a book signing. Deborah went through and she had this phenomenal setup next to us. <laughs> you an guys, empty table. You're you're on like a little crate, card, little a card crate. table. Yeah, and I had told Bob, I said, you know, I'm going to show up, but that's uh But fortunately, Susan Morris set up some planners for us, made it look nice. And as I mentioned earlier, she crocheted a, a cactus. That's beautiful. <laughs> a barrel cactus. She called it a pin cushion because it had little pins. I was going to say, was it spiky? It. Yeah, the little pins were spiking. Okay, guys, I'm looking at the clock, so even though we can't hear the music and the audio feed from the network, it is break time. We're going to take a break. Uh, Again, questions, comments, uh, back up on Facebook Live, uh, Tiger. So that's rolling along if you want to uh, watch us on Facebook Live. And again, uh, John at GardenAmerica.com. John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. I'm Brian Main. Going to take a break. Happy Saturday morning or afternoon. Coming back.
Okay, we are back. It is uh, 21 minutes after the hour here on this uh, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, depending upon where you are. And now I am hearing myself. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, we've got you hearing that, John, in the background? Yeah, I'm just going with the flow. Okay, just go with the flow here. We are fine. It has uh, been a wacky day. We had the first hour, which went for the most part okay. We've had Facebook problems. We've had audio feed problems here in the studio. But uh, you know what they say, keep on trudging on. Never give up. Never, 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 ever give up. And that was Winston Churchill. Really? Yeah. You know, we uh, took a chance talking about bees and worms. We knew that, you know, just that was going to be problems in itself. But you know what? That's okay <laughs> because, John, you can clear that up. I can't. Well, you know, uh, on Facebook, uh, Christine uh, made the comment that a bear systemic is bad for bee populations. Mm -hmm. And first of all, you're entitled to whatever you want to believe. But I've done a lot of research on this and a lot of universities have done research. And that's not true. Uh, it's something that gets spread through the Internet. Right. But tests have been done. And actually... This is my opinion, and people are welcome to disagree, right, right. but I actually think that Bayer Systemic is safer for the environment than many organic sprays. because. And we should mention that you are totally an organic gardener as far as... It, well, not totally, but I, I but usually you know. go, I, I, I garden mainly with low impact, and the, right. whatever has the least amount of impact on the environment is what I try to use. Mm -hmm. And the organic spray that we recommend most often is spinosad. But spinosad will kill bees if you spray it on them. So that's why when we recommend spraying with spinosad, which is totally organic, that you spray in the evening after the bees have gone back. Because right. once it's dried, it won't hurt bees at all. Uh, but if it's wet, it, it's going to harm bees. So you have to realize what it is you're using and uh, the best way to use it. Now, Bayer Systemic, which is applied to the soil, uh, some people think, well, it goes up into the plant uh, and poisons the plant and the pollen, so when the bees harvest it, right. it... Well, uh, that's the theory, right? Well, that's what some people think, who really um, maybe haven't researched it as much as they should. Mm -hmm. But right now, the studies that I've seen have shown that the, the um, imidacloprid molecule does not translate or trans... Uh, Locate, translocate, right. Translocate from the, through the peduncle to the flower. And the peduncle is the little stem that holds the flower on. So is the that plant. peduncle considered a barrier in a way? Well, the, the point is there's not going to be any of the imidacloprid in the flower itself, so it's not going to harm the bees. Okay. So. Now, that's the, not the same as somebody taking a product and actually spraying it onto the bee itself. That's different. No, if you spray something on. Anything you spray on a bee yeah. is probably not good for the bee. Right. But, but the theory that it's going to translocate up the plant into the pollen and the bee is going to carry that pollen and pick it up is going right. to Right, it only them. goes into the leaves and the stems. Okay. Right. So, but, but a good so comment. Any, well, that's good, though. We bring that to their well, attention. Well, it's always good to be aware of what it is you're using. So, uh, so my idea for using a systemic like this, uh, if I were, would be that it's actually going to be safer than spraying a product out in the environment. Because this is only going to go in the soil and go right up into the plant. Okay, very good. Well, and again, for... not into the flowers, so you don't have to worry about poison honey or anything like that. Okay. Now, uh, something else that gets spread around the Internet is that um, uh, bee populate, like crops have been sprayed with omidacloprid and then the bees have died. And there was an area in France where something like that happened, but the exact same thing occurred in Spain and the bee populations weren't damaged at all. So you have to look and say, what is really causing this? And in the United States, where we're losing bee populations in certain areas, there's a lot of things. Uh, one is, is um, the Averroa mite, which is attacking... Um, uh, is it the Averroa mite? I don't know. It's attacking hives? Well, it attacks the bee itself. Okay. So it, that diminishes bee populations. And then also seven, carbaryl, which beekeepers use to clean out the hives, is really toxic to bees. So There could be residual. So there's some residual from that. And then also the way bees are handled, they're moved all over, and they become, uh, you know, to some 
extent disoriented. Okay, so there's a lot so, of basically a lot of factors involved here. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot involved in in you don't want to fall into the trap of blaming one product uh, or one cause when it's multiple causes. And you actually actually might, in the case of the Bayer Systemic, be blaming a product that actually might be less harmful than some other products. So anyway, that's my thinking on it. But you're not required to use any product you don't want to. That you to. don't want to. But yeah. thanks for the explanation because that does, that does clear it yeah, up. And, and I really appreciate Christine pointing that out. Sure. Gives us a chance to mm -hmm. go into it a little bit further. No, oh, absolutely. And then, you know, it's funny, you know, because Roundup is in the news a lot right now with the, with the products, and there's a lot yes. of different ways that people can go on that. But people have to realize too that Bayer and Roundup, the names get thrown around, but there's a lot of products with the same exact chemical in it under a different name. Oh yeah. And, and then they don't realize, and they don't even realize they're using the same product. They just didn't buy it from Bayer. Right. Or they just didn't buy it from Scott's. Sure. And so, um, you know, knowing, like, you know, John pointed out, imidacloprid, that's the product. So if you buy anything on the shelf and you don't want to use imidacloprid, make sure you read the label because it's probably in there and you just don't even realize right. and it. I, and there's people that buy products that never check the label. There's people that buy products that read the label and have no idea what these these mm -hmm. names even mean. Right. So, and, and you're oh. right about, about the same chemical or the same product or the same thing being in another product. Go ahead, John. Roundup gets a bad name because it's manufactured by Monsanto. Well, and, yeah, and, now it is. And, and that's got a hit. No, they didn't. I don't know if they let the sale go through. Oh, no, they did, yeah. And that's got a whole history, too, Monsanto. Yeah, right. And and Monsanto has done some things that, <laughs> that really upset people, groups of people. So yeah. so that's the problem mm -hmm. there. The Well, that product is good. What Some of the things that um, Monsanto has been charged with doing is through their genetic modification of certain things like uh, vegetable crops and wheat yeah. to make them they've genetically modified them so that they're resistant to roundup so you can spray roundup over the fields and you can um and especially corn right which is Soy. where this all started started you can spray roundup over them and not kill the plants but and there's nothing really wrong with that, whether you believe in genetic modification or not, whether or not we should do that. Right. That's not the main problem. The main problem was since corn is wind-pollinated, the genetically modified corn started spreading to neighboring fields, and Monsanto went through and sued those farmers. Yeah, that was who, really messed up. Who tried to use that corn seed later on because they said, you've got our... Yeah. Our uh, genes in your corn. Even though that farmer never purchased it, even though right. that farmer never, you know, harvested from their own right. crop and all of that. Yeah, that is pretty messed up. Okay, we got a break coming up here. Again as, already? Yeah, as we approach, goes fast, doesn't Jeez. it? Jeez. As we approach uh, 30 minutes after the hour, do stay with us. We'd like uh, more questions, comments on Facebook or John at GardenAmerica.com on this Saturday afternoon if you're back east or Saturday morning for the rest of us. John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, I'm Brian Maine. Welcome once again. Thank you for tuning in to the Garden America radio program.
It is uh, 35 minutes after the hour back here on uh, Garden America. Thank you so much for watching us on Facebook Live. And those of you who have hung in through all the problems we had the first hour uh, seeping into the second hour with our audio and our Facebook feed, uh, we are back live on Facebook. So thank you so much for hanging in there. And uh, I have promised Tiger and John that during the week I will fix anything that is left over that might be uh, somewhat of a problem. So thank you for that. Thank you for John's explanation uh, during the last segment on the uh, the Bayer product. Uh, Going from there, we do want to announce that uh, coming soon we will be uh, on the iHeart Radio app. App. iHeart Media, the iHeart Radio app. Uh, Download the app. It's for free. And coming soon in the next uh, couple, two or three weeks, you'll be able to go to your iHeart app, which, of course, you can, you know, design your own uh, own radio station, your own music, whatever. And uh, Garden America will be on the iHeart Radio app before too long. That's iHeart Media. So go to the App Store and just download the uh, iHeart app. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Garden America appears on, on your app, your iHeart Radio app. And uh, we want to thank iHeart Media for, uh, for doing that for us. And when we're, we right before we were leaving for the break on the last thing we were kind of talking about some of the products that are out on the market and i wanted to mention that um you know when it comes to pest control or fertilizers or fungicides you know when you're when you're talking gardening is you know like john mentioned you have to think about what's better for the garden we always start mild so insecticidal soaps neem oils washing the plant off That'll solve a lot of the problems. Proper fertilization, you know, you know, we're big touters as far as feeding the soil, not just the plant. That'll take care of a lot of those problems. But sometimes when you when the problem just gets too bad, and you have to take that next step. Um, you know, citrus trees in Southern California, no matter where you buy a citrus from, they're not organic. They're all treated with metaclopids. They have to be, because we don't want um, the oh, right when I'm, you know, right when you're gonna say something yeah. and it forgets you, it's the not the late not the lace wing the um psyllid the citrus psyllid to spread throughout our state, so it's required that all citrus growers treat their trees before they get shipped anywhere throughout our state, so they know they're guaranteed not to have the citrus psyllid because that psyllid spreads the citrus greening disease which could devastate the entire industry the entire industry we're right. talking about closing it down and they have to be treated with a product it is a metacloprid and um you know i mean some people might not like that agreeable you know you don't want to use a chemical you don't want to have to have it but it does fade out over time the tree you know doesn't have it all of its life but it has to happen to protect some industries and that you know you know we have to be cautious of that but Always starting off with taking good health, taking good care of your plants is going to allow them to re, um, repel a lot of those bugs. I and mean, when we talk about the drought in Southern California, why we have such a beetle problem in our forest. Well, it's not because the beetle is some amazing beetle that can devastate forests. The problem is because we had a drought, which the trees became weak and allowed the beetle to begin to infect them and kind of go from there and stuff right. like that. So take good care of your plants and you shouldn't have a bug problem. Well, in my yard where I have a thousand roses, you think that, well, you've got to be spraying those roses all the time to keep them in good condition. Yeah. Last year, I didn't spray my y- anything in my yard for the entire no. season. You didn't have to. I don't think I did either. No. And, uh, you know, occasionally I got some aphids and like you said, Tiger, I hosed them off and plant was fine. Right. One thing about aphids is if you hose them off, they become disoriented because they're social insects. And they communicate with each other. And if you hose them off and they're laying on the ground, they can't find their way back. <laughs> <laughs> Lost. Oh. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're gone. No sense yeah. of direction. No. <laughs> and I have to admit that I was surprised at the amount of uh, praying mantis that I found in my yard last yeah. year. I mean, Love it. I would say probably a dozen. You know, and they're territorial, so they stake out areas. So that was kind of cool. We have a few emails. All right. Oh, beautiful. That, John at GardenAmerica.com. Let's do it. One I sent you a copy of because it was from our friend Steve in Simi Valley. And he says, hello, John, Brian, and Tiger. Happy spring. Here's the sweet pea jungle from farm to table. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, has a picture of the sweet peas growing out in his backyard and then a picture of a uh, uh, vase on his table indoors where he had cut them and brought them in says they're nicely fragrant then uh jimmy from oceanside jimmy oceanside talk about one of our longtime listeners says hi john brian and tiger last season i had one pequino plant now pequino is a tomato that we sell at gardenamerica.com 
Okay. And he said it overwintered from the previous season. So I guess he's this is going into the third year for hmm. it. And he says, and I had two that were newly planted. Between these three plants, I stopped counting when the tomatoes reached well over 600. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. said, I recently cut them back, and the two newer plants are already aggressively growing. Have a good day. You know, between, between Jimmy and Steve and Simi Valley, <laughs> I don't know that they've ever killed anything. <laughs> He also adds a P.S. Uh, I keep missing Tiger at his nursery. Oh, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm not there too often. No, Sorry. You're, you're out in the field. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I, 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 I'm always off and about. And I would imagine for Jimmy in Oceanside, that's a long drive. Yeah. That's right down right. the freeway. It's certainly worth the drive. Well, absolutely. Right? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Maybe you might want to call next time and make sure Tiger's there, Jimmy. Yeah, make yeah, an appointment. Shoot me a message. Yeah, make an appointment. What else do you have for us, John? Anything Did on you... the uh, email? Did you get that acanthus identified? Yeah, I'm not sure which one, though, because of the flower. The color of that flower is kind of odd, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. I've never seen it before. Yeah, I, I'm going I'm to have to look that up. What other questions? Uh, that's it on the email questions. I was trying to look I think up. we caught up on Facebook, I believe. Okay, yes. I, I was trying to find... Um, I was trying to find our newsletter... Would you like me to bring it up? <laughs> well, I already brought it up. You mean the, try, new, the newsletter you created? A... Yeah, the one you created. Yeah. I There was something in the newsletter that I wanted to mention, and I, I have no idea what it was now. So so we won't do that. By the way, if you want to know how that Pacino tomato is spelled, it's spelled like Pacino in El Pacino. Oh. But it's pronounced Pacino. Well, maybe maybe that's his real name, El Pacino. After all these years. I we, think that would be the Italian pronunciation. Right. Because C-H is pronounced K. And his agent said, now nah, let's go with Pacino. Yeah. To, okay. The, the C-H right. sound in Italian is two C's in a row. So you would have, uh, uh, yeah. if you had two C's, you'd get the C-H sound. Okay. Makes sense. You know what I'm, what I'm saying? Right. Uh, now, I knew a Buzalaki, B-U-S-A-L-A-C-C-H-I, when I grew up. Pronounced Buzalaki. Because you got CH. Right. Yeah, so that makes that goes along with what you said. That right. makes that makes sense now. Yeah, and the Fineschi Rose Garden uh, in Italy is uh, S-C-H-I. Now, Nataka, Fineschi. you looked at me. Do you know the Buzalaki family? Yeah, restaurants. Yep, and the Giacalonis? Yep. 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 Anybody who lives in San Diego for a period of time knows those families. I thought Giacalonis were a myth. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, the acanthus that we found, acanthus senni, S-E-N-N. I, I oh. is the one I think it is. And um, it's a, so for any of our listeners that know Acanthus is Bears Breach. It's a large, usually tall, white slash purple flower spike with tubular flowers. Very dramatic. I mean, how tall have you seen them get? Six, seven feet tall, right? You know, uh, the, 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 flower the flower spike. spike. Yeah. You know, standing up in the air. Very dramatic. Lovely plant. Um, Great but, for the shade. Yeah, the it, one that we were sent was had a red flower, and I've never seen that in our interest in in our um, inventory right. at the nursery. That was came from Eileen up in uh, El Granada. Sent us a picture, wanted to know if we knew what it was. But you know the acanthus, I really like. Have you seen the ones with the variegated leaves that are out? No, I think one's called uh, is it Tidewater, and the other one is called uh, something Angel. I uh, can't think of it. <laughs> Did you think of the newsletter uh, thing you wanted to talk to us about? <laughs> no, I've already moved on. Okay. Yeah, we're, 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 he's sure. done thinking about that. Um, next week, our our person that we're going to be interviewing is Dr. Rowden with the Audubon Society. So we're going to so, so we next week talk we're talking about, about the, the birds. birds. We got the bees. We got the bees. This now week. the birds. There yep. you go. Isn't that the thing you drive on in Europe? The Audubon. Yes. <laughs> I always look at John. Well, I wanted to. I I had to say it because I wanted to make sure I said it right. Right. What, I did say it right. 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 The auto. Well, the the what yeah. is that, John? In Europe, where the there's no speed limit. Germany, the autobahn. Yeah, the right. autobahn. Right. Yeah. But, exactly. But it isn't the bird society called the auto. That's autobahn. Autobahn. The yes. autobahn society. Right. B O N. Right. Right. The bond is B A 
HN. HN. Okay, oh, for okay. the German. But okay. very, very similar, very yeah. close. Yeah. Otto so Bonn. We're not talking cars next week. So this week it was bees. Next week it was birds. Yeah. Just, just out of order. No, next week it will be birds. It will be it birds. Will be birds. Got to get your tenses correct. Boy, thank you for catching. <laughs> you know, my mind is 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 wandering this morning with all the problems yeah, we've had, and yeah. and is everything sounding okay? I'm not even sure what I've said the last 20 minutes. But we're excited because you know has as. as John had mentioned at the very beginning of the show is right now is when spring is erupting. So the birds are coming out. Right. And just like our other creatures that help our garden, birds are an integral part of that. And so when we see populations move around the country, they do the big, what is it called? The big bird count every year yeah. where they ask oh, yeah. everybody to go out in their backyards right. and count just document. Birds. And, and, and that helps a, with population count. What a great way. Why not use... Everybody has a computer nowadays, for the most part. Everybody yes. has a phone that connects to the internet, for the most part. Why not use us all to figure out? Rather than sending out all these field ops to be able to go and count birds, you can once a year have everyone in the nation count birds. I think they even might even do it worldwide. Well, how do you know you're not counting the same bird twice? They, I, they probably take that into consideration. You know, you know you got a factor I'm of error. I think I, it might have been Susan Morris yesterday was telling me about one of the gardens that had planted hummingbird plants to attract hummingbirds, and she had hundreds, thousands of hummingbirds coming into this garden. Based upon the plants that they, that they planted? Yeah, and they had, um, had that plus maybe, uh, it was between 50 and 100 hummingbird feeders. Wow. wow. Yeah, and wow is said, right. She said that they had microchipped the hummingbirds, uh, behind their necks, uh-huh. and any time they went into the feeders, they it was recorded. So they have all this data of these hummingbirds, how many times they're going into the feeders, which one, where they're wow. coming from. By the way, we are in a break on the radio, but I figure as long as we're on Facebook, <laughs> we just keep talking. We're just we're just going to keep on going. <laughs> we're just going to keep on going because the commercials were not yeah. coming through anyway right. yeah. uh, from the network, so we're just going to keep on talking on Facebook. So, and if, I know that that's not really what happened. I know what really happened. You just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you saying that I wasn't paying attention to my clock? Yeah, Be- exactly. because because you I were, can't hear the network feed from my through my headsets. You right. were, no, it it was why that Bayer bottle was up in the center of our display earlier. Right. It's because so, you got too enthralled in staring So, at So me. for anybody that cares, uh, we had some things fall on my board uh, this morning and uh, disconnected us, or at least the, the network feed, so we cannot hear the network from our end. But Facebook Live continues, and we're just going to keep on marching along as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, because we so, still have audio through that. Still have audio through that. Uh, so, so every year you speak of birds, we had finches for like three or four years that nested in our patio, and the last two years we had hummingbirds. And I did notice that hummingbirds are very territorial. And yes. it just takes aggressive. one or two aggressive ones to try to keep the rest of them out of your patio, your yard, or even near your bird feeder. You had the finches nesting in your hanging baskets, right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And then last year, or the last two years, the hummingbirds uh, found, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, I think it was a Dracaena uh, plant that I had in the patio. They just, and they were very clever, too, because they find ways of getting um, behind uh, to where the, the crows and other predators can't see them. So they're, they're closest to the house, but on the other side of the plant, it faces outward. So, uh, so other birds can't see them. Savvy. Smart. I always find it amazing when you see that crow or that hawk flying through the air getting chased by, by, a smaller, bird. by smaller birds. It always makes me chuckle when I see that. But it's interesting to think that these little little mighty birds – or that brave to take on a big crow or something. Absolutely. <laughs> well, they're very territorial. So yeah. you're suggesting we go out and count the birds. Yes. I forget what day that is. I'll have to look that up, and we'll have to talk to him about that next weekend, about counting the birds and what the concept is as far as why we need to understand our bird population. Or The thing, too, that's happening is that their migratory patterns are changing, so they want to understand where they're moving and mm-hmm. why we're not seeing them here anymore versus why they're moving down there kind of a thing. Okay, we're going to take just a quick minute break here. We're going to come right back and rejoin the network as we normally do uh, with our final segment coming up. Uh, Stay with us.
Now we are back on, synced up with our uh, radio friends. Thank you so much. Uh, back on Facebook Live, it is 51 minutes after the hour. Here on Biz Talk Radio, do want to remind our listeners and our viewers again that uh, coming soon, perhaps within the next month, we will be heard on the iHeart Radio app. Go to your app store on your phone, download the iHeart Radio app, and you'll be able to take us wherever you go. Garden America on the iHeart app coming in about a month or so. We'll get some podcasts together and uh, do that. Once again, the app is free. It doesn't cost you anything. Once you have the app, you can create your own radio stations, download your favorite music, so on and so forth. But uh, this means you can take us now wherever you go on the iHeart Radio app. That is Garden America coming in the next month or so. We'll have reminders coming up on uh, Facebook, Facebook Live, and uh, also during the radio show in the next uh, several weeks. That is the iHeart Radio app. Go to your app store and download it. All right, uh, John at GardenAmerica.com. Any questions? You can also ask questions uh, for the next uh, few remaining minutes on Facebook Live. Also, 855-424-9825. I think that's the first time I gave out the phone number this morning. <laughs> uh, but again, John at GardenAmerica.com, or for the next uh, eight minutes or so, also uh, on uh, Facebook Live. And again, that's Facebook Live, John at GardenAmerica.com. You know, since I'm selling my house and going to be moving and have to move plants... <laughs> And I'm stressing out over this. I think what I'm going to do... I wouldn't want to be you at all. I think what I'm going to do tomorrow is um, maybe go out and make a list of the things that have to be moved that can't be replaced. Because there's yeah, probably that's a good idea. three or 400 roses in the ground. Uh, the ones in containers, obviously, I can move without any problem. But the ones in the ground, uh, I think that maybe I might have 50 or 60 that really need to... You know, it's to never going to be too early for you to start doing all this, inventorying and figure out what, what you can take and what you can't. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. That's a monumental job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, helping, I'm helping his cause. Yeah, you're stressing him out <laughs> exactly. even more. You are stressing me out okay. a little bit. Uh, it's going to be fine. It's going to be a breeze. You so, know, Patty did mention that, uh, uh, put out on Facebook, she said, oh, she says, what a great excuse for a yard sale. <laughs> right, exactly. I saw that. You have people come dig things up. There you go. You know, like, pick your own, you know, for fruits, strawberries, pick your own. It's like, dig your own. Mm -hmm. Come dig your landscape. <laughs> what was that? Uh, Widener's you used to go out and dig up begonias? Oh, yeah. Was, oh, it, yeah. was it begonias, begonias, right? Begonias, and then in the fall, they would do pansies. Is that, they but, would yeah, it was dig two, up, they, tuberous they, begonias every They would spring. put them in a field. You would go and dig up your own. That was my first, that reminds me of a story. No, that was story my, time with John. <laughs> my first experience with planning things when I moved from Michigan to, to uh, California, we moved to the end of June. And I, it was either the end of June or the end of May. We moved to San Marcos. And Wideners was having their begonia sale. Well, in Michigan, we grew tuberous begonias with no problems. And I heard about this, saw this uh, advertised in the paper. We went down to Widener's, dug up our own begonias, came and planted them in front of our house. And so excited to see these giant tuberous begonias. And the next day, there was a Santa Ana, which I oh, had never gosh. experienced before. <laughs> Every one of those tuberous begonias just fried. They were. Yeah, you live and learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my first learning that there was something there was, called the Santa, Santa Ana, Ana wind. Dry yeah. hot wind. Oh, my gosh. worry about. Um, Patty also mentioned that just so people know that the bird count that we were talking about where the people go, the great backyard bird count was held back in February, which I find it funny to hold in February. That's because, a little early, isn't it? Well, I imagine the full population isn't out and about at that time across the nation. I mean, you know, can you imagine doing that in New York in February? It's probably a blizzard going on. Well, where did you think they went? What well, do you they're... mean? No, no, no. Like, why would you do a bird count when you're not going to see any birds? I know, but I'm just saying, where did the birds go in they February? Went south. So wouldn't they be counting them in the south? But if they're still but, but if they counted, go into right? well, not if they go to Mexico or South America. Oh. Right? So so birds that naturally live south of the equator, they, they don't, don't go counted. anywhere. They don't go anywhere. Yeah. They don't fly north for the winter, right? <laughs> I don't fly know. south for the winter. <laughs> they keep going. They're, they're but they're already south. <laughs> uh. They fly further south. Oh, they fly north for the winter. Because, like, right now we're getting it, we're going to get into our summer months here. South of the equator, Australia, they're going to be getting into their winter months. It's probably right. fall right now. And right. I think when you're south of the equator, they fly backwards, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and then Lenore said that she would love to see some pics from Steve and Simi Valley. And 
Lenore, I want to tell her we, that we post we, these picks a lot. Yeah, we I've do, got, yeah, we do. In yeah. the newsletter and on our Facebook, on Facebook there's quite a few were the last picks ones I posted carnations from Steve. So yeah. definitely, um, you know, check those out because we always get wonderful updates on what's going on in his yard or what's blooming at that moment in time. But our newsletter is great because at the bottom of it, it's the what's growing area where you right. post three or four pictures from people that have sent you them over the week mm-hmm. and well, what's Lenora happening. Always sends us pictures to post. Yeah. We, we have a lot of her pictures to post there. And she did send me an email too, that said, uh, hi, John got the tomato package in perfect condition. Your packaging is outstanding. Thank and you and so we much. should mention too that John does all of this himself. <laughs> yeah, and that's well, hundreds and hundreds yeah. of uh, packaging that goes on. I can I can handle some of it, but then we've got to bring in help when we've got heavy sure. packaging. Tiger, I would not have gotten tomatoes out last year without Tiger's help. Yeah, I'm looking that's forward to going work. up there and yeah. helping out with that. It's fun. Sharon, it's... Sharon even helped last year and brought her friend <laughs> to to help do the packaging, oh, that's, and then my great. sons came and helped. So. It's so definitely not me. It's it's neat to see where we send plants to. I right. mean, who, who, it's it's amazing to, to look at the addresses and where we're sending plants and what what varieties we're sending to. Um, because I always wonder what draws people to certain varieties. Right. What, what draws people? You know to where, certain where they live and why they're buying what they're buying. Yeah, exactly. Now, do you ever see people that are purchasing things and you you look at where the state or where they're from and you think to yourself, oh yeah. You know what? They're pushing you it. Probably shouldn't be buying this plan for where you live in your zone. I think. Well, most you know of the time what? we're I shipping. Send those people a note. You yeah. let them know. A little warning, disclaimer. Right. Like last Monday, I sent plants to Massachusetts, and I sent them a note. I said, "Hey, you know, just want to make sure you really want these plants because it's way too early for your area." And they sent back a note. Said, "Oh, thank you for checking, but we have a greenhouse and." We okay, start perfect. them early and they'll be fine. And that's what that's what I was going to say is usually it's just vegetables, right? But for the most part, it's more the time that they get it, not that whether the plant will be okay. We're right. out of time, guys. Just like Whoa, that, wow. I'm, I'm paying attention to the clock. Thank you so much. Hey, for those that were with us the first hour, thank you for uh, sitting through some of the problems we had. Uh, thank you for your support. We do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to say bye for now for the entire crew. I want to thank uh, Zach and Jeremiah from uh, Biz Talk Radio, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. I'm Brian Main. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great week. And remember, till next week, get growing America. Take care. Have a safe week.